All right. This morning we'll be, as you see here, going through the book of Philemon. We'll be looking at the whole book, so we have a lot to cover. Before we do so, let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer as we ask him for his grace and his power to move mightily this morning. Let's pray. Our good God, we do thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for your kindness. Lord, your mercy never fails us, O oh Lord, and your kindness is renewed to us day by day. Lord, for as your word says, you make the sun to rise both upon the righteous and the unrighteous. And Lord, we know that we are all unrighteous. We thank you, O Lord, for your loving kindness that does us good all the days of our life. Lord, we thank you that we know that, you are, that we are your children, for you have called us the children of God through Jesus Christ, our elder brother, who has come and who's lived and died and rised in our place, that we might be united to you through your Spirit. And Lord, we thank you that through your Spirit, you are binding us together as a holy people, as a holy temple to the Lord. And God, we do pray that your Spirit would come and renew and refresh our temples this morning, Lord, that we'd be made holier and purer by your power and your word. And God, we pray that this word, which is often hard for modern ears to hear, to be open and to hear it, and to not to put ourselves above the word of God, thinking that we can critique it, O Lord, but that we would be critiqued by this word knowing, O Lord, that your word is perfect and without flaw and speaks to every issue and every time. Lord, I pray for myself that you give me the grace I need to utter your words well with your power, with your feeling, with your spirit, Lord, for apart from you I can do nothing. Lord, we thank you that your word promises that when your word is preached, your church is built and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So God, we pray that you'd come and that you'd speak and that you'd build your church for the glory of your name and for the joy of of your people. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Then Peter came up and said to our Lord, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me, and shall I still forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus replied, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one slave who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And just as a side note, 10,000 talents is a lot of money. As you may know, a denarii was worth one day's wage for a day laborer, about 60 bucks in today's money. And it was about 60,000 denarii that would make up one talent. So when you do the math, this makes up 180,000 years of day laboring service was this debt. That is to say, this was an unpayable debt. Let's keep reading. One slave owed him 10,000 talents, and he was brought to him. But since this slave did not have the means to repay, his slave master commanded that he be sold along with his wife and his children, and with all that he had, so that repayment could be made. So that slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before his Lord and said, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the master of that slave felt compassion, and he released him and forgave him the debt of all those talents. But that slave went out that day and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him but a few hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and pleaded with him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. But that slave was unwilling. And he went and threw his other slave, that other slave, until he could pay him back what was owed him. He threw him into prison. So when all the fellow slaves saw what one slave had done to another slave, They were deeply grieved and came and reported to their slave master all that had happened. Then summoning him, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all of that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave 
in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his master, moved with anger, handed that slave over to the torturers to torture his body until he would repay him those 10,000 talents. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each one of you does not forgive his brother or his sister from his heart. Friends, this morning, I would like for us to consider a flesh and blood example of Jesus' parable in the short letter that Paul wrote to the slave master Philemon. We will consider that the book of Philemon itself is an embodiment of this parable and how those who've been forgiven a great debt by Christ can forgive the much smaller debts that men owe them. And this is our main idea that we're going to look at this morning from Philemon, is that the Spirit of Christ powerfully works for radical transformation and reconciliation in the church. Our main idea from Philemon is this, is that the Spirit of Christ powerfully works for radical transformation and reconciliation in the church, as we'll talk about it a bit at the end. And that powerful transformation and reconciliation can and should extend from the church into all the world. That's what we'll be looking at this morning. Now, for those of you who know the book of Philemon, and as you've heard me say a hot-button term more than a few times already, slaves and slave masters and slavery, I will not be engaging the issue of slavery or the Bible's witness to it or the Bible's witness to abolition or the need for abolition. For though abolition, that is to say that's a fancy word that refers to the freeing of slaves, is found in seed form as an implication of what Paul wrote to a slave owner. That's not the focus of this letter. Westerners, because of the hideous past we have as it relates to slavery, often think that slavery is at the forefront of this letter, and friend, it is not, though we may wish that it was. Abolition, and the Bible's witness to the need for abolition, is not the main idea of this small letter, though it is very clearly an implication from this letter based upon what Paul says as a witness to Philemon about his slave Onesimus. Friends, we only have one message for this book on this one Sunday. Therefore, our time is short. So I cannot focus on that massive and important issue of slavery and the Bible's witness to it. So then I must focus on the main point of this letter, which as you've already heard me say, is about reconciliation between an estranged party. It's not about the abolition of slavery. This book is about the radical transformation that Jesus brings into the church and the reconciliation that should be the outcome of two slaves bought by Christ who forgive the little debts they have to one another because they've been forgiven an unforgivable debt by their slave master, Jesus Christ. That's what the book of Philemon is about. So that in mind, let's read Paul's letter to Philemon. We're going to read all of it, so please bear with me. And I'm reading from the NASB. And it says this, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love, Philemon, and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love. Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, 
Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Philemon, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but would be of your own free will. For perhaps Onesimus was for this reason separated from you, Philemon, for a while, that you would have him back forever. But no longer as a slave, but then more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then, Philemon, you regard me as a partner, accept Onesimus as you would accept me. But if Onesimus has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, Philemon, charge that to my account. I, the Apostle Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay the debt. Not to mention to you, Philemon, that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I have said. At the same time, also prepare for me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you, as do Mark, Astarchus, Demas, Luke, and all my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, Philemon. This is the word of the Lord. Again, our main idea this morning is this, is that the Spirit of Christ powerfully works for radical transformation and reconciliation in the church. Now to see this and to break down this letter, I'm going to have us look at a few things to make sense of what Paul is saying to Philemon here. So first, let's just consider the three important people in this letter. So first, we have the Apostle Paul, and he, in a church like this that teaches the Word, needs no introduction, does he not? Paul, the great apostle, the former persecutor of the Church of Christ, that vehement man Saul who went from church to church, ravaging the Church of God, converted by by the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, powerfully knocked down, blinded by the light of Christ's glory, who, as Jesus says to him at that time, You will be my witness to the Gentiles, my light to the Gentiles. And so the great missionary, the Apostle Paul, was born. And this letter, as you can see, is written at the near end of his life. For what does he say? I am an old man now. He is at the end of all of his missionary journeys, most likely writing this letter like so many of his other letters from prison. He's been faithful to the Lord and that call. He has ministered the gospel of Christ, as he says in the book of Romans, from Iliacrim all the way through Jerusalem, so that he does not have a place to set his foot where the gospel has not been preached. He is a prisoner of the Lord, bound in chains. Even as I said last week, he's chained in Rome in house arrest, but the word remains unchained. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter. Then we have Philemon, a Christian and a slave owner. It's a hard combination for us to hear, but here we must, because he was both. He was a slave owner of at least one slave, namely the slave Onesimus. And we know that Philemon was converted under Paul's ministry Sometime in the past, that's what you see in verse 19, where Paul refers to this debt that Philemon owes him. So most likely, the Apostle Paul, during his ministry in Colossae, the city of Colossae, sorry, we know it as a book of Colossians, but it's the city of Colossae, 
in Asia Minor. Paul ministered the gospel, and Philemon heard it and was converted. So just like he says here about Onesimus, that he birthed Onesimus or fathered Onesimus, so too Paul implies and reminds Philemon, I fathered you. You owe me your life in Christ. Now, again, this is hard for us to understand because of the rightful hatred we have of slavery and slave owners granted the history of this country. Philemon, as we see in the beginning of this letter, is described as someone who has great love for all the saints. He has great love for all the saints. And he has strong faith, rich faith in the Lord Jesus. And it also says that he is a man whose goodness and good works are known to all. And here's an interesting point to consider. How would, how would the Apostle Paul most likely have heard of this man's faith and of his love? most likely from Onesimus, the slave of that man. The slave testified to his slave owner's goodness and towards his love and towards his faith. And knowing, as we'll see next about Onesimus, he was a Christian slave converted by the Apostle Paul while Paul was in prison. So the implication was that Onesimus was not converted to Christ in the household of Philemon. Philemon came, so he wasn't a Christian. Philemon came to Paul by some means and testified to Paul of his slave owner's fidelity, his faith, his love, and he spoke the truth even before he was a Christian. That says a lot about that man. Onesimus was a slave. We don't know if he was born a slave, if he was captured in war, if he sold himself into slavery, All those things were possible in ancient Rome. But what we see is that sometime he got to the Apostle Paul. He ran away, for whatever reason, from Philemon. And from all that we can tell in this letter, Philemon seemed to have been a good man. He most likely did not treat his slaves harshly. Maybe before he had been converted, he was a harsh slave owner. And maybe those memories made Onesimus run away. But again, all of this is speculation. We don't know why Onesimus ran away, but we know that he did run away. He did run away. And somehow he made himself to the apostle Paul. Was he intending to go to Paul? Did he happen to get in trouble for something else and get thrown into the same jail? We don't know. But somehow Onesimus made his way to Paul in prison. He testified to Philemon's fidelity. And in prison, Paul converted Philemon, sorry, converted Onesimus to the faith. And it seems in verse 18 that when Onesimus fled Philemon's home, he took with him some sort of possessions or money or whatever he needed for his journey wherever he was going. Paul talked about this debt that Onesimus has. So most likely before he left, maybe in anger for all the years of being in slavery, maybe because of mistreatment, whatever reason he had, he took what was not his and he fled. And most likely, as was common in ancient Rome, Philemon was looking for his slave, put up posters for him, offered descriptions of his slave, offered a reward, was looking to have his slave brought back. It was his property. And yet in prison, that slave converted to Christ, fleeing for his life for whatever reason, met Paul in prison and met Jesus in prison. And as Paul says, Onesimus had been a faithful minister to all of the Apostle Paul's needs. He'd been a faithful minister to all the Apostle Paul's needs. So those are the three people we have in this book. We have Philemon, we have Paul, and we have Onesimus. Those are our three characters. So let's Think about the storyline for a second, which I've already alluded to already. So first, we see in verse 19 that at some time in the past, we don't know when, Philemon incurred a debt to Paul. Most likely, his conversion to Christ. That Paul either played an integral or a secondary uh, uh, part in. And then we see throughout the letter, Paul is imprisoned 
for his gospel ministry. Paul's sitting in prison because of the gospel ministry. And then Onesimus the slave runs away. And remember, under Roman law, just like under law in this country in the past, it was illegal for a slave to run away. And as I noted, he most likely took things for his journey and incurred a debt. So he's broken two laws. He's ran away from a slave owner, and he's stolen from him for provisions for the journey. And somehow, and there's been much scholarly speculation, which I won't get into, as to how these two met in prison. But met they did. Paul converts Onesimus to the faith. Paul hears of Philemon's love and faith from Onesimus and this other man named Epaphras. So then Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon. He sends him back to his slave master. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, it's possible that he also sent Colossians with him, the book of Colossians. And again, without getting into their scholarly debate as to when Philemon was written and when Colossians was written and how those two works relate to each other. I'm of the mind that these two works are most likely written at the same time. The other option that most scholars would agree on is that Philemon was written first, and then sometime later Colossians was written. If you want to know the arguments for both, ask me later. But that's a tangential point. So whatever the case is, at least as regards Philemon, Paul tells Onesimus, go back. Go back to your master and take this letter with you. Say, okay, so then at the next point, Onesimus and the letter arrive. And as we can see at the beginning of the letter here in Philippians, they're read in the household church, of which Philemon is a part. So this may be the church that's described in the letter to the Colossians, maybe the same church that meets in a house in Colossae, a cell church of a bigger church, we don't know. But at some point, there's a church, Philemon finds himself in the household church, and he says, read this letter before all of them. Most likely, Philemon is going to respond to Paul's letter, which Paul anticipates in verse 20 and 21. You'll do more than I ask of you. I'm confident that you're going to benefit me. So Philemon is going to respond positively to Paul's letter, Paul believes. Paul, we can see in verse 22, anticipates making a visit to Philemon sometime in the future. He believes that they're on good enough terms that he can ask of Philemon, make sure you prepare a guest room for me. And based on what we see in Colossians and in the testimony of the early church, it seems that Philemon welcomed Onesimus back. He heeded the Apostle Paul's commandments and restored him, not but as a slave, but as a brother in the Lord. Now what happens next depends on how you understand the relationship, as I said, about the book of Philemon and the book of Colossians and their order. If you believe that Philemon is written before Colossians and what most likely happened next is that Onesimus later returns to Paul from Philemon's hand at a later date. And he returns to him at a later date, but before Paul writes Colossians. And then Paul writes Colossians and Philemon has already sent Onesimus away. He's either sent away as a freedman or as a servant to Paul on Philemon's behalf. And then Paul writes Colossians And we see that in that letter, Onesimus is spoken of as a minister of the Apostle Paul. So that's one way to view it. Or if Philemon and Colossians are written together, Onesimus is sent back with both letters as an emissary of the Apostle Paul, together with the letter to Colossae. And that then adds weight to Paul's commandment to Philemon to receive Onesimus back as a brother. Whatever we see going on in these two relationships of the letter and their timing, clearly Onesimus is considered as one of Paul's emissaries. He considers him as a fellow worker, and he's to to be received back into the fellowship of the church. Then we see that in church tradition, it may be the case that Onesimus, this Onesimus, who was once a runaway slave, is later consecrated as a bishop by the early church, to fill the bishopric of Ephesus. And if you know your Bible, Timothy was the bishop, was the elder over the church in Ephesus. And Onesimus then becomes the bishop of the church 
at Ephesus. That's quite the story. A runaway young slave converted by Paul in prison who becomes one of the great elders of the church in Asia Minor. And church tradition says that Onesimus died under the persecution of a man named Trajan. Some say he was stoned, some say he was burned, some say he was beheaded. What we do know is that Ignatius, in his epistle to Ephesus, speaks very highly of Onesimus. And this was written in the beginning of the second century. Again, so get that. We went from a man, a young man ran away from his slave owner, broke the law in Rome, stole and fled. Listens to Paul, goes back. He's not punished. He's restored in love as a brother in the church. He is then raised up by the church as a leader. And eventually is such a great leader that he becomes the bishop of Ephesus and leads the church in Asia Minor and dies a death worthy of Christ under the emperor Trajan. That's a story that only the Lord Jesus can write, is it not? Now, having seen all that, let's consider what seems to be the main commandment here in this letter. And there is much debate as to what Paul is commanding. What is he commanding? And let let me say a few of the options before we move through it and come to what I believe is the option. So, the first is what's plainly stated in the text. Receive him back as a brother. Welcome him. And do not count any of his debts against him. Forgive him in Christ as you've been forgiven. Those are the clear commandments in the text. Second would be that, plus, depending on how you read some of the earlier part of the letter, Paul's strongly urging him through highly contextual language, sort of an arm twisting, you could say, but gentle, kind arm twisting, send him back to me so that he might be my servant of the gospel, so to speak. And then the third option, which is not clearly stated in the text, but is implied by some of Paul's statements, is receive him back, restore him as a brother, forgive him, maybe also send him back to me. But then the third option would be the command here that he's saying, I I don't want to command you, I want to compel you to do it from love, would be to free Onesimus from slavery. To use the fancy term, it's called manumission. To manumit him, to let him go away free. Those are the three options here. What is Paul commanding? Is it merely to receive him back as a brother, to forgive him all of his debts? Or is it also to do that, plus send him back to Paul as an emissary of the gospel and a servant of Paul's ministry? Or third, Is it also to free him from his bonds and to let him be a freed man in Christ? Those are our few options here. Now, as we try to understand Paul's command to Philemon about the slave Onesimus, we need to keep a few texts in mind that color and shape Paul's command here. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, Neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you all are one in Christ. What some scholars call Paul's great Magna Carta as it regards the abolition of slavery. There's neither slave nor free. All are one in Christ. There is equal footing before the cross of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, or slave or free, we're all made to drink of one Spirit. There are not many spirits in the church. For the Greek or the Jew or the slave or the free, there is one Spirit, one body that unites all in all. There is neither slave nor free. They all drink of the same waters of the Spirit of God. Colossians 3 Put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. 
Christ is in all, whether you are slave or free. You all get the same Christ. You all get the same Spirit. You are all one in the Lord. There is no distinction in standing, no distinction in the reception of blessing or the reception of God's gracious gifts. We all get the same ones. And then 1 Corinthians 7, each person is to remain in the state in which they were called. Were you called as a slave? Don't let it concern you. But if you are able to become free, take advantage of that and do it. For the one who was called in the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, the one who is called as free is the slave of Christ. You were bought for a price. Don't become slaves of people. Brothers and sisters, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. And then the commands from Colossians 3 that maybe were being read within the same hour of this letter. Slaves, obey those who are your human masters in everything, not with eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. He is your master. For the one who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, slave masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And lastly, Deuteronomy 23. You shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall live with you in your midst, in the place that he chooses, where it pleases him. You shall not mistreat him. You shall not hand over to the master the slave who's escaped from his house and come to you. Paul has that in mind. Even as he knows in Roman law, as I've mentioned, that Roman law compelled, if you found a slave, you had to return them back to their master. So Paul has all these things working in his mind as he writes this letter. So with these things in mind, let's look at verses 10 to 21 more closely to discern what Paul's command is to Philemon regarding the runaway slave. So as we see in verses 10 through 11, Paul fathered Onesimus in prison. And now Paul begins to to play on this name Onesimus, which if you have a little note in your Bible, it may tell you that Onesimus sounds like the Greek word useful. So Paul says, Onesimus, the useful one, used to be useless to you, but now he's coming back useful to you and useful for me. Now, it's interesting because most likely Onesimus was a very useful slave to Philemon. But Paul says he used to be useless to you, but now he's useful. Paul's making a point as it regards usefulness in Christ. That's what matters. Christ and his kingdom. He's coming back to you to be useful in the Lord. He's already been useful in the Lord for me. Recognize him as such. Maybe he will manumit him and let him go. He may be useless for him as a slave in that regard, but he will be useful in the Lord. Onesimus, the the useful one, will prove to be useful for Paul and for Philemon and the kingdom. And we see that this usefulness has already proven true because Paul says that he's had his heart captured by Onesimus. He says, I'm sending back my very heart to you. Paul had come to love this young man as his own son. And he loved him to such an extent that he wanted to keep Onesimus, the useful one, with him that he might service Paul and the gospel. This is how Onesimus is now useful to Paul and Philemon, that he might be a minister for the gospel on Paul's behalf. He's useful to both of them. Verse 14, Paul has sent Onesimus back in person 
to Philemon, so that Paul would not do anything with Philemon, Philemon's slave, that is Onesimus, without his approval. He says here, without your consent. Paul, again, as Westerners in the 21st century, maybe we wish that Paul just said, free him. I'm your father in the Lord. I'm the apostle Paul. Let him go. Paul doesn't do that. He says, I don't want to do anything without your own accord. I don't want to do anything without your consent. I don't want to do that. I'm going to send him back, and I want you to do what is right. He does not want Philemon to do what he would command. And again, notice the power structures here. Philemon is the slave owner over Onesimus. He can do them what he wills. Again, we may not like it, but slaves were the complete property of the slave master. Their body, their minds, their thoughts, their will, everything belonged to their slave master. But then Paul recognizes and says, I'm your father. I'm an authority over you. But I'm not going to use that authority to command you. In love, rather, I'm going to compel you to do what is right. He desires for Philemon to do the right thing of his own free will, of his own good intention. And then we notice in verses 15 and 16, the status between slave and master had been radically altered. Listen. No longer, you're to receive him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What a radical transformation the gospel has brought. This is why the church in the first few centuries changed the world. Because they were flipping all social structures on their head. All relationships, neither Jew nor Greek, rich nor poor, male nor female, slave nor free. We are all one in Christ. You two are brothers in the Lord. See that. You are not slave master and slave. Though that may still be true functionally. Truthfully, you're brothers in the Lord. You're one in Christ. You have one master. You drink from one spirit or built into the same temple. You're one. You are the same. He's your brother. And he says, he's more of a brother to you than to me. What a word. Again, recognize how significant this would have been in the first century. Slave masters had the right to do anything with their slaves that they wanted. As I read in preparation for this, there are well-known stories of men who would use the same slave to dress up as a woman to serve their sexual desires, to then dress up as a servant to serve them their food and their drink before their friends. Some who wrote books, some who carried cars, some who waited tables, some who worked in the field, some who served kings. There were many slaves in the ancient world. But one thing united them all. They were not of their own accord. As one slave said who got his freedom in the 19th century, one thing defined slavery, that of the chains. My mind was chained. My will was chained. My mouth was chained. My body was chained. They had no freedom apart from their master. And Paul looks at him and says, he is your brother. He is your equal. View him as such. It's Those words, friend, that would prove to be the seed that would grow into the movement of abolition in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, though that's not what he says here. Now again, up until this point, Paul is using high context language and indirect speech to persuade Philemon to do what is right. But the question is, what is the right thing he wants him to do? But what we see in verses 17 and 19 is that he finally gives him the only direct commands you see in the letter. He tells him in verses 17 and 19, accept Onesimus as a brother, as if Philemon were accepting Paul himself. That's the command. Accept Onesimus back as a brother as if you would accept me, the apostle Paul, the minister of Christ. Second, Philemon is to forgive Onesimus of any 
wrong that he has committed, in addition to relieving him of any debts occurred, charging them to Paul, as Paul says, I will repay them. And Paul reminds Philemon, Philemon, you owe me a debt. You owe me your very life. Remember that. Receive Philemon back. Sorry, Philemon, receive Onesimus back as a brother. See him as one with you and the Lord. Forgive him any of his debts. And if he has to repay anything, account them to me and I will repay them. You had a debt to me, Philemon. He has a debt to you. Remember that and forgive it, even as if I were to forgive you your debt. And he says in verse 21, Paul has confidence that Philemon will do even more than what he has said. And I wish we had more time, but the question is, what does Paul mean by that? What's the even more than what I've said? What he has said is, hey, receive him back as a brother and forgive him of his debts. We wish Paul would have said more. We don't know what he means, that I am confident you will do even more than that. Is that to send him back to Paul as an emissary of the gospel, still as a enslaved man? Or is that for Philemon to release him of his chains and to let him go free and to go back to Paul if he wills? We don't know what Paul was saying. What we can say definitively is that the command was for Philemon to receive Onesimus back as an equal, forgive him all of his debts, and do not hold any ill will or intentions against him. He was to treat him fairly, to treat him kindly, and to love him as a brother. What is clear and not speculative is that Paul's main point to Philemon is that Christ's Spirit powerfully works for radical transformation and reconciliation in the church. You are to forgive debts, to not consider social status, but to see your unity in Christ. Remembering as we read at the forefront, we all have an unpayable debt that Christ has paid. So who can we be to look at someone else, a fellow slave of Christ, and say, you owe me a few dollars. Pay them back. When Jesus has forgiven you, an unpayable debt against him. So friends, as we look at Philemon, we are reminded that Jesus performs a mighty work of transformation in the church among the slaves of Christ. Now let me just say a couple words of application here at the end. Now there may be a few here today who are those who are enslaved to sin who need to find true freedom in Christ. You are not Onesimus as it regards the Lord. You are not useful for Jesus and his kingdom. You are useless You do not submit to the Lord. You do not heed his word. You are not reconciled to God through the Savior, Jesus Christ. You are a slave to sin. As Jesus says, those who sin are slaves to it. You are not Onesimus to the Lord. You are not useful. You are only useful to your father, the devil. As Jesus says, those who lie, those who tell untruths are like their father, the devil, who's been lying from the beginning. Your God is your belly. You are like swine who wallow in the filthiness of your sin, a dog who returns to its vomit again and again. You are not useful to the Lord. You need to become Onesimus. You need to become useful, but this is not a thing you can do of your own accord. Christ alone transforms slaves to sin and makes them slaves of righteousness. You must cry out to Christ, the slave master of all men and women, and ask him to redeem you, to save you from the chains that have bound you, to cry out to him to make you free. For free you think you are, but enslaved in fact you are. Your mind is not your own. Your will is not your own. Your thoughts are not your own. As St. Augustine has said, in this life, on this side of the garden and on the other side of eternity, all you can do is sin and do nothing but sin. So think yourself not a freed man or a freed woman in this world. You are a slave with hidden spiritual shackles that you do not see. So turn to Christ and find true freedom in the one who can make you whole, in the one who can make you Onesimus and make you useful to the Lord.
who can take you as one who was once a slave and transform you into a bishop for the kingdom. Call out to Christ. Call out to God, your Savior. And now for those who are the slaves of Christ. For remember, that is what we are. As 1 Corinthians 6 says, friend, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Honor God with your body. We need to be Onesimus as it regards the Lord. We need to be useful for the Lord and His kingdom. As Paul says, if you are in Christ and you're free, you're a slave to Christ. Friends, we are slaves to Christ, which means our will is not our own, our mind is not our own, our thoughts are not our own, our life's goals are not our own. He says and we do. We don't like to hear that, which is why our modern translations do not say the doulos of the Lord is the slave of the Lord. What do we say? We're bondservants. Friend, I'm here to tell you the Greek word is clear. You and I are slaves of Christ. He is our slave master. He commands whatever he desires so that we follow him wherever he wills. We have no choice. So I commend you to your, to your Savior, your master Christ. Be Onesimus unto him. Be useful. And what we can see in this text as it regards our usefulness in the church, is to remember Jesus' parable about forgiveness. Friend, you've been forgiven a great debt by the Lord. A bigger debt than you or I could ever pay. So when your brother or your sister here in this church sins against you, forgive them not seven times, but seventy times seven. Have a forgiving heart. A heart that recognizes you've been forgiven of so much. How can you for, not forgive your brother or your sister of the little squabbles that you have amongst yourself? Be useful. Don't be unuseful. Love each other in the church. Forgive one another your debts. In love, cover them all. For Christ in his love has covered them all. And lastly, as it regards the matter of slavery, the church can and should work for the redemption of physical bonds which still clink around this world. And though our culture loves lately to talk about our evil past, that same voice fails to recognize the tens of millions of slaves that are enslaved around this world today. Boys and girls trapped in sex slavery or trapped on ships in Thailand fishing without their own wills. People who are forced to clean and to cook in Africa and Asia. Millions of children here in America who are enslaved in dungeons to perform the pleasures of evil men. So we need not think that we are somehow a higher nation than those in the past who gave a wink to slavery, for we are as wicked as they. So then like this letter says, we need to be those, and this would be a good life to live, young men and women, to advocate for those who are enslaved, to spend your life fighting for their freedom, for there are slaves, millions of them around us today. And Paul's word to Philemon is the same word to us your brothers and sisters in the Lord. We must work for redemption and work for wholeness because Christ has worked for redemption and wholeness as well. Might we remember that in Christ we can all be useful to the Lord as we submit to his sovereign lordship. Let's pray together. Our great God, we thank you for your kindness and for your word. Lord, that you have saved us from sin You've redeemed us from evil and from wickedness. God, and you've made us the slaves of the King Most High. Oh God, we pray that we'd be men and women who would honor our Lord, honor our Savior, and be faithful unto the call that you have called us to. Oh God, make us a church who live as light and salt in this world. Use us to reach out to those who are in bonds and work for their freedom. For you've worked for our freedom. Oh Christ, we long for you to do the work in this church and in our generation that the ears of all who hear it would tingle and say, surely there is a Lord in heaven who does all that he pleases. We pray this through Christ. Amen. this time we're going to be entering into time of prayer to respond to the message of God from book of Philemon uh, let us
first pray about just reflect about how we were forgiven by Jesus Christ if we forget how we have been forgiven I think it's very easy to demand for retribution from others but I think especially uh, for the birth of Christ as we are celebrating how God sent his one and only son to die for us and to forgive us and to lead us not just to the cross but to to the power of life to the resurrection let us not forget at this time of the forgiveness and all our sin that has been nailed upon the cross and how the wrath of God has not come to us but it has been taken it has been drunk by Jesus Christ on the cross so we do not have to drink the cup of wrath that is devastating from the maker of the universe from the sovereign God so at this time let us reflect about the forgiveness of God and if you do not know how God has forgiven you through Jesus Christ he has he loves you that's why he sent his one and only son and maybe today is the time that you by the power of the spirit see how good His glory is, how His love is. So let us enter in the time of prayer. let us pray for the broken relationships that my, uh, we might have in our life uh, whether it be with family whether it be with friends or once friends or whoever it might be uh, as the story of Philemon demonstrates to us I believe that every relationship every broken relationship has potential to show the love of Christ if the other person is not a believer then we can show the love of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Perhaps it will not lead to reconciliation yet, but we can exemplify what we have tasted from the Lord Jesus Christ. And if this is with the other fellow believer who have the Spirit of Christ in them, perhaps we can show forgiveness to each other and take the necessary steps for reconciliation at the necessary time uh, led by God but I truly believe that every broken relationship has a potential to show Jesus Christ so let us pray um, whoever you might have broken relationship with it's gonna hurt we're not gonna want to think about it we want to push it aside we don't want to bring it back up from maybe perhaps years of therapy that we have gone through in order to bury it or to move past it but perhaps the power of Christ 
can transform our perspective and give us power of forgiveness and possibly to reconciliation. So let us pray in regards to that. I'm here. 
the forgiveness from the cross. And we thank you for the salvation that you have shown us. And we just want to pray that we want to follow you as our master, the good master who is fair and righteous, who exemplified to us of the power of the mercy, Lord. And as we have learned of your forgiveness and mercy upon our lives, I pray that we'll be able to do the same. It might hurt. It might not be the same. It might take us a lot of time to get there, Lord, but just pray that you'll have mercy upon us and yes, you'll be patient with us and that you will also plant in our heart deeply and root in us of your love so that we may be able to show the love of Christ even through broken relationships that we might have in our lives, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have saved us Lord, we thank you for being our master. Lord, we thank you for always providing us with the way of escape, Lord. And some of us really need that wisdom. And some of us in this moment, we really need that restoration and refreshment that only comes from you, Lord. Lord, would you help us taste that living water in our lives, Lord. Lord, if we are dry in our hearts, spiritually dry, just pray. that you will get us through and let us not be ashamed let us not be embarrassed to cling unto you so that we may testify how you were always there with us lord we thank you and may the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen